All right, we're going to go ahead and get started here today. I'd like to welcome our audience as well as our panelists to the Sustainable Fleet Technology Webinar Series 2023. This is session number one. Um, today, we're going to talk about uh, roadmap to fl fleet electrification, which is a, a really broad topic, but you know, just about everybody out there right now uh, being pressured uh, to look at sustainability and electrification and, and folks are at, at various stages. Some have no clue as to where to start. Others have started and others are, are down the path a little bit. And we're gonna give you some, some general information um, that will help you some things to consider, questions to be asking. Um, I think Chris in his presentation stole my line that you know everything is actually is a custom, not any deployment, any situation, but you know, there are some steps and questions you want to ask. So that's what we're going to give you kind of the heuristic formula, how I say it. You know, there's, there's the recipe for chili, um, many recipes for chili. And it really depends upon the situation, your likes, and, and et cetera. So that's kind of where we're at. Hopefully, this will be helpful. And uh, we're going to go from there. I'd like to thank our sponsors um, for 2023. Here are our current sponsors. And we are still opening and accepting sponsors for this year. All companies that have something that could potentially help you, not all focused on, on one specific technology or thing. Um, you know, there's some management inf information systems, um, data, data and fleet is, is paramount now. That's how decisions are made. Um, you know, Tops Auto Gas has both an electric uh, charging solution as well as their traditional they've been doing for years. Uh, all good companies with things that may be able to help you. So check them out, and if you you have a need or a want, you know I can connect you or um, et cetera. Um, we're going to run these sessions um, through the year. We don't go too far ahead, just in case there's a hot topic we want to throw in there. Here's our next two. We'll populate some more in the the coming weeks and get out and go from there. But we're doing medium and heavy duty charging infrastructure challenges and considerations, and then we're going to focus on charging strategies, some best practice and lessons learned, and try and look at some different use cases and fleet types. The, let's say the place where all this is housed is at sustainablefleetexpo.com. It has both the, uh, the conference and the webinar uh, information. There's registration links, there's past sessions, the recordings and the handouts, and they'll be posted on this site, sustainablefleetexpo.com. Uh, within a few days and at that um, in terms of the contributors or folks that are helping with these sessions the clean energy technology center nafa uh, viatech sourcewell and ncdot they're the folks that that help make this happen our format is similar to what we've done in the past even though we're on zoom today so it may be a little bit different our registration was a little bit um, involved a few more steps but i think once you have your your account, it should be straightforward going going into the future for other sessions. Hold Q and A to the end. Submit your questions, comments to the chat. We're scheduled to two, two to three fifteen. We're going to try and get our presentations done uh, before the hour uh, to allow for Q and A. Um, if there is meaningful discussion, I'm fully willing to keep the line open. Um, don't feel you have to stay. And and same to our panelists. I know everybody's busy. If you have to go, you have to go. But if, if we have meaningful discussion, I'm willing to, to keep it open and keep, keep the dialogue going. We do have the handout of these slides and the recording. They will be sent to everyone that registered uh, within the next couple of days. And that's it for that. Here is our agenda. I'm Rick Sapienza. I'm doing our introduction. Welcome right now. We're going to lead off with Sarah Fisher from the Electrification Coalition. She's going to do um, an overview and then we'll get perspectives on you know, what they're doing and you know how things are going and how they got to where they're at at this point from the city of Charlotte and the city of Atlanta. Here's my contact information. I am a resource. Please feel free to reach out to me. I will help you in any way I can. Um, and if I can't, I will connect you with a resource that can. Leading off is Sarah Fisher with the Electrification Coalition. Um, uh, folks that are on with our, our pre, pre banter, um, Sarah, the, the Electrification Coalition has a number of tools and does some, some work to help fleets. And Charlotte has been one of their fleets, one of their star students. And I'm going to let Sarah take over from here. 
Thanks, Rick. I will say, I think we have learned things from Charlotte as well. So I'll say it's a teacher-student relationship both ways. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining today. My name is Sarah Fisher. Like Rick mentioned, I'm a program manager at the Electrification Coalition. For those of you who haven't heard of us, we are a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization working to advance transportation electrification. I will be sure to drop a link to our website in the chat for those of you interested in learning more about our current projects. And next slide. Today, I am going to do a really brief high-level overview of steps to fleet electrification planning. Um, this topic could probably take all day to explain in depth, so I'm going to give a warning that this will be a high-level overview. Um, I'm going to breeze through these slides, and I'm happy to have follow-up conversations with anyone afterwards, but I want to make sure I save extra time for our two fleets to share their real word world experience. So the topics that I'm going to broadly cover today are fleet electric fleet vehicle identification, um, charging strategy considerations, and for the sake of time, I'm not going to cover the actual deployment considerations of charging infrastructure, but I will talk about a useful funding tool that might help in those planning um, conversations, and I believe Chris and Robert are going to talk more about their actual experience planning and deploying charging stations for their fleets. Next slide. So first up, these are the major things we like to consider when we are talking to folks about beginning our fleet electrification planning journey. First, to plan your transition to electric, you really need to understand your current fleet, its vehicles, and how they're used. So step one is gathering fleet usage and storage data, and I'll talk more about what those useful data points are on the next slide. Second, we need to analyze that data, and I'll talk about our preferred method of fleet analysis, when, which focuses on the total cost of ownership of adopting electric vehicles into your fleet. And then using your analysis results, you can plan a timeline for cost-effective transition to electric vehicles, dependent on vehicle type, usage needs, storage locations, and more. Third, you can use your prioritized list of vehicles to replace with electric options, along with your fleet usage data and storage information to identify sites to be prioritized for charging infrastructure. Some fleets have a relatively straightforward process of installing chargers at one fleet depot location. Others may have vehicles that travel long distances and need to charge on the road. Um, you might have vehicles that uh, return to employee residences at night. So different strategies would need to be planned for those vehicles. Once you've identified those charging sites, you'll also need to go through the process of site evaluation with electricians and utilities to identify the feasibility and cost of infrastructure installation. And fourth, fleets will need to work on procurement planning for both their identified vehicles and infrastructure equipment. Some fleets may choose to institute procurement policies and processes. I know Charlotte has an incredible sustainable and resilient fleet policy, which we give as examples to a lot of fleets. Um, and throughout this entire process, fleets will also want to keep on top of what grants and other incentives are available to offset the cost of vehicles and charging infrastructure, especially if your fleet analysis identifies any candidates that might not achieve lifetime savings today from an electric replacement option. And next slide. So the data that I typically recommend fleets fall look into um, falls into two categories. So those are vehicle characteristics and use data. Vehicle data to track includes VINs, year, make, model, fuel type, estimated life, both uh, total years and remaining years in the fleet, and annual vehicle miles traveled. Remaining life isn't necessarily going to be used in any fleet analysis calculations, but it can be helpful to prioritize which vehicle should be replaced with electric first if you already have eligible vehicles near the end of their life cycle. 
for those of you who have telemed who don't have telematics data uh, or who haven't tracked your fleet data before, we can often use current odometer readings and the age of the vehicles in your fleet to get a rough estimate of the vehicle miles traveled. So don't think if you have not started tracking your data before um, that it's going to be impossible for you to start this process. And then use data includes the primary driver of a vehicle, the department that uses it, any equipment or cargo needs, the vehicle's typical storage location or use route, and maximum and weekly usage. Knowing the driver and the department of a vehicle will help you determine if there are any special considerations you need to have in mind for replacement EV models. Some fleets that I talk to, they have departments that prefer specific brands or uh, really need a vehicle that has all wheel drive capabilities. And so that can kind of help you determine what EV options are out there that are eligible for your fleet. Um, equipment and cargo needs can also help you narrow applicable EV models and might help you determine if a vehicle could be downsized based on what it actually needs to do. Knowing the vehicle storage location will help you plan out charging infrastructure, and knowing the route might help you identify areas for on-route charging if that's something that your fleet needs in future transitions. If your fleet experiences heavy usage during any particular time of the year, reporting that maximum daily or weekly mileage can really help make sure that your planning is accurate for charging infrastructure. Um, for example, I have a fleet that they only use certain vehicles during harvest season, and so if we assumed that that vehicle's mileage was evenly spread throughout the year, we might estimate a different number of needed charging stations, but we know it needs to be used almost constantly with high turnover uh, during one part of the year, and so that helps us plan um, a faster charging strategy rather than a lower speed charging strategy throughout the year. And next slide. Once you have your data, we recommend that all fleets start out with a fleet analysis. Fleet analysis can continue helping you outline those data points like what your fleet owns, what vehicle might needs to, to be right sized, and the actual use needs of the vehicles. But it takes your information a step farther and can help identify the total cost of ownership of electric vehicle fleet options based on how your fleet uses its current vehicles and can help make the business case for electrification. The results of that fleet analysis can also be used to create a long-term transition plan for EVs. If you have candidates in your fleet that aren't great for electrification today, it can help you figure out when they would be good candidates for electrification. Next slide. At the EC, we use a tool called DRIVE, which stands for Dashboard for Rapid Vehicle Electrification. Um, we created it in partnership with Atlas Public Policy, which is another fantastic organization in this space, and it helps us identify which current fleet vehicles are the best candidates for electrification today and in the future. Um, it helps you pull in your current fleet vehicles and compares them to a potential gas replacement option and a potential electric replacement option. So you can really see the comparison of the total cost of ownership between those two vehicles. Uh, the reason we made this tool, uh, for those of you who have done fleet analysis in the past, either on your own or through a consultant, standard fleet analysis can be very expensive, it can take a long time, and it can be difficult to interpret if you don't have a technical background. So the drive tool is really designed as a free, easy to use tool. I will um, drop the link uh, to the tool on our website in the chat, but it's free to download. Um, it's an Excel-based tool that anyone can use, um, and it can essentially provide a full fleet analysis within minutes. Um, it can also integrate a number of different variables that can be really helpful if you want to customize your fleet analysis, like integrating charging costs into the actual total cost of ownership analysis of your vehicles, or integrating those incentives to see how those impact the total cost of ownership analysis. So it's a, an incredible um, free resource and happy to chat more about that with anyone who has questions on it. Next slide. 
This is just an example of what uh, a couple of the charts from the drive tool look like. The one on the left um, really breaks down what uh, categories of costs were included in this particular analysis. And it's helpful to visualize how the operational costs of an EV are so much less expensive that they offset if an EV has a higher upfront purchase price. Um, there are only maintenance, fuel costs, and overall purchase price in this analysis, but you can see with the key on the right that you can include financing, insurance, um, all types of other considerations in there as well. Um, and then the chart on the right just shows that it will give you a, an average estimate of the percent savings by original fleet vehicle. And the next slide will give you a breakdown of all of the uh, vehicles that you ran in your analysis by their VIN number, um, the conventional replacement vehicle that they were mapped to, and the electric replacement vehicle that they were mapped to, along with the estimated percent savings, the likelihood of transitioning to EVs giving you savings, and a number of other data points that you can customize. Um, so it can really help you identify not only which of your vehicles are a good candidate for electrification now, but what the savings you would potentially achieve from transitioning to a specific electric model. Next slide. So once you uh, have your analysis results and you know which EV models in particular you're interested in for your fleet, you can start to prioritize what uh, or how many charging stations you might need for your fleet. So this is an example of a really rough estimation calculation that I have done for fleets. Um, you essentially divide the estimated weekly miles traveled by the range of your proposed EV, and that will give you the estimated number of charges needed per week. If you add all of those up and divide by the number of days your fleet operates per week, you can estimate how many charging stations you would actually need available on a given day. In this example, we found uh, that this group of seven vehicles could feasibly be charged with just two charging ports based on how those vehicles are used and the range of the potential models the fleet was looking at. I will note again, if you have vehicles that need to be charged outside of the depot, either on the road or at an employee residence, those would need to be planned on a case-by-case -case basis because they wouldn't necessarily be um, charging during downtime at a fleet depot like these vehicles. Next slide. One of the other infrastructure steps you'll want to take is evaluating the type of charging infrastructure you want or need. Um, some of those considerations might be something like the example on this slide, you know, networked versus non-network stations. A lot of fleets choose to go with networked for the data that they want to collect from those charging stations, but some fleets find that if they don't need that data, non-network stations can reduce installation costs and really um, get their vehicle charged and that's all that they need. You also want to consider do you need level two or level three stations for those high turnover vehicles? What vendors you want to look at? Do you want your charging stations to have open charging protocol so that if you choose to use a different software in the future, your hardware doesn't need to be replaced as well? So there are a number of considerations, um, types of technology and things like that that you would want to research in this stage as well. And next slide. And as a rough set of guidelines, these are what most fleets find are the lowest hanging fruit vehicles and sites. So uh, light duty, traditionally right now, those vehicles are easier to electrify than medium and heavy duty just based on where the market is. Um, we are expecting there to be a, a bigger market for medium and heavy duty modicle of model availability in the future, but the fleets that have transitioned today heavily focusing on light duty first. Um, vehicles scheduled for replacement soon are definitely good to prioritize for electrification because if you put a new vehicle in service today, it's going to be in your fleet for potentially eight to 10 years and we want to electrify those options if we can. 
Uh, vehicles that have short set routes, those might be easier to transition as compared to if you have any fleet vehicles that drive cross state and don't have a central depot to return to just because you have to plan those charging routes a little bit uh, with a little bit more care. So those depot vehicles are definitely easier. Um, and the, the next point there also about um, vehicles that return to a depot at night easier to plan charging for because they are already sitting in a central location with downtime overnight. Site considerations. If you own a, a site, that can be easier to install charging infrastructure at as opposed to if you lease any sites, because if you lease a site, you'll have to work with the actual site owner to get permission and work with their facilities team. Um, if most vehicles are stored at one or two locations for your fleet, those are good sites to start out with charging so that you have the potential to transition the highest number of vehicles to electric. And if you are considering um, the equity impacts of your fleet, we also have fleets look at if your fleet depots or your fleet routes are situated in a disproportionately advantaged community, we have uh, seen fleets start to prioritize those locations so that they can reduce their community impacts before they start looking at any other vehicles. And then uh, in addition, any sites that are preparing for or undergoing construction in the near future, excellent sites to prioritize because you are reducing your installation costs for sites that are already going to be undergoing construction, um, trenching and boring, conduit laying and things like that. It can really help reduce uh, costs as opposed to retrofitting a site with charging infrastructure. Next slide. So uh, one of the things we also like to tell fleets about charging infrastructure planning is you want to plan your site evaluations in advance. Um, the rough kind of estimate right now for how long a charging installation can take has changed a little bit. Typically, we have heard from utilities that from site walks to actual charging installation, it can take anywhere from seven to eight months typically. But now, especially due to staff shortages and supply chain disruptions, some utilities are quoting 11 to 16 months for installation of the needed electrical upgrades and the actual equipment. Um, those timelines will vary based on your location and type of infrastructure, but either way, you want to start having those conversations early so that you know you're going to have infrastructure in place before your vehicles arrive and they can immediately get into operation. Next slide. When you start to have those site evaluations, these are the things that hopefully after earlier steps you will have um, in your back pocket to bring to those discussions. So you want to know what types of charging equipment you want to install. Exact models can be helpful just because it provides the electricians and the utility um, staff with the exact kind of electrical capacity considerations they'll need to consider. Same with quantity of stations. Um, you will want to bring the number of stations you ideally want to install immediately. And if you have plans for installing future charging infrastructure, uh, having that information available will help the utility and the electricians give you quotes as to, do you need any electrical upgrades to support that capacity today in the future? Should we lay any conduit today to prevent um, additional future costs and things like that? And then if you have preferred locations for those charging stations in your fleet depot, um, that's always good to provide. Um, it might not be the best location, depending on where your existing electrical capacity is. You'll typically want to install those charging stations as close as possible to your existing electrical service to cut down on costs. But any preferences like that are great to bring to the conversations as well. And next slide. And what to take from site evaluations. I'm not going to read all of these just for the sake of time, but the, the things that you really want to get out of these conversations include um, what electrical capacity your site has and what you actually need. What upgrades do you need? What will it cost to make those upgrades so that if you have multiple sites you're considering, you can see which one makes the most sense to prioritize right now. And I'll go ahead to the next slide. 
If you are early in these conversations, we also like to outline that these are the stakeholders that you want to start engaging. Um, it might be fleet maintenance staff and managers, fleet vehicle users, facility owners and managers, and any procurement authorities in your organization so that you could really start to plan out what this process will look like. The earlier you engage these folks, the better so that you don't have to wait weeks to track them down later to ask questions. And then external stakeholders that you might think about identifying and engaging are utility representatives, electricians, and any vehicle or charging infrastructure vendors that you are interested in learning more about. Next slide. The last thing I will quickly share is as you're starting this journey and trying to figure out where to find funding, the EC has this really incredible tool we just released and we are updating it as additional federal guidance comes out. But you can go into the EV funding finder tool, select what type of group you represent <laughs> and the funding scenario that you are interested in. So whether you want to look at light duty vehicles or heavy duty infrastructure and the tool if you um, click to the next slide, Rick, it will spit out um, a case study example of what a, an organization in your situation might have applied for, but it will also spit out an entire list of every potential funding source that you would be eligible for based on your potential project. Um, and if you click on those links, it'll tell you any considerations you might need need to take into account like due dates, matching grants, things like that. So I will drop the link to that as well in the chat, um, but really great resource and it'll continue to be updated. So please take a look at that if you're looking for funding in this process. And I think if you go to the next slide, real quick summary um, of what we talked about, really the, the major things you wanna do are collect that data, run a fleet analysis, if you are able, developing a core EV or EVSE team can be really beneficial. I know City of Charlotte has a co-working group that meets monthly on these topics, and it's really helpful getting departments together to coordinate. Um, and then keeping up to date with the, the federal funding and state funding announcements can be particularly helpful if you have started this process and are ready to start buying vehicles and installing infrastructure. I think that is the end of my slides. So I will pass back to you, Rick. Sarah, thank you. Some really good points, a lot of information. So we, we are going to make these slides available and, and your tools will be accessible as well. You know, the you know, a couple of the points, you know, your worst case or you know, maximum um, for folks that operate in severe heat or cold, you need to make an adjustment based on a stated range. That's that could be some of your worst case. And then maybe days where you're loading your vehicles a little more than you usually do. Um, another good point is you don't necessarily need one-to-one -one charger per vehicle. We're seeing with a lot of fleets, especially municipal, where you have a you know a geographic boundary, anywhere from two to five and maybe more vehicles per cord. So I really thank you, and, and hopefully this helps our our group. So next up um, is Chris Davis. Chris Davis is with the City of Charlotte and Fleet. He's um, been in the missile government for quite a while and has been doing a lot of good work. I've worked with Chris uh, here and there for a number of years now, and I'm gonna let them talk about what they've been up to and how they've approached this and what they've learned. Chris? Yeah, thanks, Rick. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Again, I'm Chris Davis, the fleet manager with the City of Charlotte's Department of Transportation. So just one of the city's departments. And I work with our bigger fleet management group and our sustainability teams. Uh, trying to meet our needs while advancing our city goals and policies to promote sustainable and uh, resiliency as we move into the future. Next slide, please, Rick. So uh, as you may know, the world is experiencing a transportation transformation as we transition from fossil fuel vehicles to electric vehicles. Next, please. So Charlotte's transition from fossil fuels will help us deliver quality public service while promoting safety, health, and equity uh, and quality of life to our citizens. We're using our plans and policies and goals to reduce our vehicle emissions, and we strive to source 100% of our energy from zero uh, carbon sources by 2030. 
and we use our sustainable energy action plan to frame those efforts. Next, please. So our sustainable and resilient fleet policy directs us to shift energy use from fossil fuels to zero carbon energy sources, guiding our purchases of electric vehicles. And as Sarah said, we work closely with EC and um, we have annual meetings for vehicle replacements and we have used their drive tool to help us um, with some of our proposed replacements for this upcoming year, for instance. Next slide, please. So here at the city of Charlotte, we're investing in electric vehicles and charging infrastructure and our people. We strive to buy the right vehicle for the right job, have the right infrastructure and fueling for, for whatever our vehicles or equipment are, and the uh, right training and tooling for our technicians to keep our EVs operational. We have over 100 240 volt level two chargers installed to date allowing us to charge nearly 200 EVs at once. Most of those are du dual port, about 60 uh, of those are open to the public. And we have more chargers under construction and being planned. We have over 80 EVs in service currently with more on order, including the Ford F-150 Lightnings. Um, this fiscal year, we're planning to spend $1.45 million on additional chargers and we're ordering 55 more EVs, including buses, an all-electric fire truck, and some preliminary electric police vehicles, bringing the total of electric vehicles the city will have to 174. Next, Rick. Um, transitioning the EVs requires commitment and leadership, so I, I made up this little roadmap. It's not the city's, it's just some of my ideas, but it takes plans, policies, goals, and actions. It's critical, critically important to learn and gain understanding about the various types of EVs and chargers. Um, is we have to effectively select, fund, purchase, and deploy EVs uh, and chargers needed to support them. And purchasing EVs is the easy part. Deploying the chargers uh, has be, been the biggest challenge that we've had, especially when we look at the different type of charging needs, working with utilities, contractors, permitting existing facilities and uh, working with the funding we have available. There's learning curves along the way, but we can get where we want to go with commitment, funding and hard work. Next, please. Uh, here in the photos, a few of our uh, EVs, we have a F-150 Lightning in service and like a Kia Nero EV. Uh, electric street sweeper we use for our bike lanes, a new Chevy Bolt, and a Mustang Mach-E. And uh, like I said, buying the EVs is the easy part. There's lots of vehicles and equipment that are meeting our demands. But it's still important to understand your needs and your operations to be successful. We do use uh, tele telematics on many of our vehicles, and we have worked with DC to highlight, you know, and to understand where our vehicles go, what they do the kind of mileage we drive so that we can determine where EV will fit and where it won't. Um, of course, there is lots to learn about the vehicles, charging infrastructure, and we have to continually keep learning. Um, that is, that's really important. And it's uh, important for you as you become a, your own EV expert. Next slide, please. So I wanted to talk a little about just battery um, and battery chemistries that are changing. So lithium ion batteries have been the standard in EVs, but uh, they're transitioning. Next slide, please. So new lithium ion battery chemistry with 90% nickel and just 5% cobalt delivers great energy density and low cobalt content reduces the ethical and environmental concerns with EVs. So as technologies are improving, we, we have fewer concerns and it's just getting better all the time. And advances in the technology helps ensure safety and it reduces the risk of fire, which is already way less than internal combustion engines. But um, we have uh, just more and more work to do as we transition away from fossil fuels. Next slide, please. So many automakers are transitioning to lithium iron phosphate batteries um, th that's the type of battery that's used in our compact electric street sweeper. They offer significantly longer battery life 
and may lower battery costs up to 10 to 15 percent, which is important because the batteries account for about 30 percent of the EV's total costs. Next slide, please. And batteries aren't just for vehicles. We're piloting a program looking at battery sto storage for solar energy, and we're investing in battery buffered um, EV charging or, or investigating, I should say. Um, battery storage in, of electricity produced from renewable energy is increasingly viable and provides energy in lockstep with electricity demands. Next slide, please. To date, Charlotte's installed 931 kilowatts of solar. Um, we have 828 kilowatts of uh, new solar under construction and 416 kilowatts in design to help uh, power electric vehicles and charging facilities um, into the future. Next slide, please. So uh, electricity availability will be important especially as we convert more uh, of our vehicles and equipment to EVs, especially when we get into medium or heavy duty trucks. And like Sarah was saying, as, as we transition, we're getting closer and closer to price parity and total cost, especially when we consider the total cost of, inter, all, uh, excuse me, the total cost of ownership, um, which makes EVs more and more attractive. Next slide, please. So here we is some data that uh, one of my colleagues used, I believe, from BC's drive tool. But we're nearing a point where total cost of ownership and electric vehicles will be near or lower than the total cost of ownership of fossil fuel power vehicles. And the more EVs are driven, the lower the total cost of ownership becomes, making utilization a key to success. Uh, it's important when you buy EVs that you have folks use them. Next slide, please. And operating costs for EVs can provide significant reductions in fuel and maintenance costs compared to uh, fossil fuel power vehicles. Uh, EVs uh, look like they're going to save about 30% uh, the cost in maintenance of fuel from internal combustion engines. Next slide. Uh, installing EV charging infrastructure is critical. Here's some of our uh, different charging installations. Installing charging infrastructure can be a challenge and ongoing advances require continuing learning. When planning to uh, transition to EVs, you must plan for your charging needs and understand what those needs are and your capabilities and the challenges. By understanding your needs, you can select what will work for you. Some EVs uh, may only need level one, which is just a wall outlet, but most will need the 240 volt level two charging, and some will need direct current fast charging, which is shown in the top right picture. But as EVs change, chargers can are changing too. And at this point, personally, I wouldn't recommend the solar chargers like shown on the bottom left. Um, I, there again, everybody has different needs in different situations. Level two seems to be a good use case but uh, I, again, the chargers are changing. They should be a, a minimum of 11 kilowatts per hour, in my opinion. And if you're installing direct current fast chargers, um, they need to be at least 150 kilowatts. Some of the newer chargers are deploying 350 kilowatts with even uh, gigawatt chargers uh, coming for larger vehicles. Next slide. After installing more than 100 level two chargers, uh, we've learned a lot. We've learned no two sites are the same, as Rick was saying, and infrastructure costs um, can vary greatly from site to site. It's important to identify your charger locations um, during site visits with project managers, electrical engineers, facility managers, and your maintenance staff. Often the closer to the electrical supply the charger locations can be um, will make the project less expensive, like Sarah said. And uh, it's also important to remember anytime you put in chargers, at least here in uh, Charlotte, um, ADA accommodations are required when installing the chargers and using charger park charger parking restrictions. Um, it's good to use your uh, stakeholders to come up with signage and uh, best practices. Um, it's also good to work with your design engineers to get your plans approved 
and it's best to only bid approved plans to, to limit changes and expedite projects. Next, please. So when planning for EVs, it's best to plan for charging infrastructure um, and your charging needs. Uh, ident identifying your charger needs where charging will happen is important. Like uh, they were saying, at, at domiciled locations, whether it's at home, et cetera. Next slide, please. So when planning charging, it's good to determine where your uh, locations may work well. You can evaluate a location's electrical ca capacity for charging and contrast it to the current electrical load at the site to determine if electrical capacity is available for chargers. You can determine what's available for EV charging and create an energy demand expectations for the location based on your anticipated EV charging needs. And it's also important to consider charging infrastructure options and obstacles to ensure the site's well suited for EV charging and remember to allow room for expansion whenever possible. Next, please. So when uh, selecting your sites, it's good to be realistic when determining the locations uh, to locate charging stations so they're convenient and they accommodate other activities. Uh, you want to use charger cord management with retract retractable cords that keep uh, walks clear and prevent damage and accidents. You can use curbs or wheel stops and setbacks to avoid accidental charger damage. And, but you need to keep uh, mobility issues and ADA requirements in mind. And it's good to um, cite chargers to avoid vandalism, considering options that may reduce tampering and use signs to, to um, guide desired usage. Next, please. We've learned it's important to work with your utilities early and often when installing chargers. Um, site visits should be attended again by project managers, electrical engineers, facility managers and maintenance staff, and um, electrical engineers should attend the project meetings. It's helpful to conduct a rough inspection and final inspection when installing and charging. And when working with contracted electrical engineers, it's best to gather as much information as you can, like the actual electrical use for your facility, pan panel schedules, and detailed floor plans and electrical plans for your facilities. Next, please. So like Sarah mentioned, you have some kind of dumb chargers and smart chargers, um, networked or non-networked. The network chargers can provide data, station monitoring, fleet access, charger restrictions, station reservations, and fault monitoring. But sometimes simple low-cost chargers, well, they're always available, but sometimes they might meet your needs best. Next, please. And uh, it's also good to put in submetering to submeter your electrical panels so you have separate billing for your EVs that's separate from your facilities to help keep your facility managers happy. Um, software can help manage electrical loads to avoid demand charges for your electricity. It's good to make room for transformers and other infrastructure that meets your needs. Once a, a place is built, it can be hard. Uh, are challenging to provide all the service you need for EV infrastructure. Um, and it's good to challenge the status quo and pilot new technologies and solutions like microgrids and renewables. And again, future-proof wherever possible, adding conduit and sleeves and uh, things of that nature are most affordable when you're doing the project and you have trenches open and whatnot. Next slide, please. And lastly, it's important, again, to plan for vandalism. Cord theft is an issue. Um, there could be issues with payment systems or screens and networks. So you need to plan for your maintenance and uh, whether or not you do uh, warranties and ongoing care for your charging systems. Next slide, please. So uh, to recap, to succeed with EVs, you need leadership and buy-in with commitment and plans and policies, established roles and responsibilities, and understanding supported by investment and champions like yourself. Next slide. And this concludes uh, my presentation. Feel free to contact me if you like. Uh, my email is shown there on the screen. 
And uh, I also post a lot of what we're doing in Charlotte on LinkedIn. So uh, if you want to take a picture of the QR code there, that will link you to my LinkedIn account. I'd like to thank you for your time. Great, Chris, thank you. Again, a lot of information there, some really good points. Um, one that came up that, that I've run to several times is charges get put in and um, electric bills go way up. And who's gonna pay for that? You need to figure that out somehow. This, I've seen some cases where there's just some finger pointing. The future proofing, when you're putting in, in stuff, need to think into the future because trenching is some of the most expensive part of putting in your, your infrastructure. And um, they do break. I mean, you need to plan on maintaining them when they first put out, let's say the first wave of chargers that went out, it was kind of a set it and forget it mentality. And now they've, they've come up where you're doing, um, you know, your <clears throat> routine maintenance and inspection, kind of like you do with your HVAC system at home. You do your, your annual maintenance. You need to do that. And then, you know, cords and connectors and things do wear out and break. Um, don't expect these things to be up 100% of the time. Be prepared to to fix them and, and get them back in, in when you need them. So maybe need a little buffer there as well. But thank you, Chris. Next up, um, uh, Robert Horton with the city of Atlanta. He is a director in the Office of Asset Accountability and Management. And he's gonna talk about some of the things Atlanta's doing um, in a big picture way. Robert, yours? Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you, Rick, for the introduction. Uh, you can move to the next slide. Oh, that's basically me, my uh, information. If anybody wants to contact me, there's my email, and I'd be happy to help you any way I can. Next. Okay, first we'll talk about uh, my department, which I uh, handle under the uh, Office of Asset and Accountability. We're responsible for the Department of Watersheds fleet and also the warehouses, but mainly we'll be talking about the fleet today. Next. Okay, in the city of Atlanta, we're one of the uh, largest, we have one of the largest fleets, uh, approximately uh, 1,435 vehicles. I couldn't really see that. Uh, basically, as you see, a bunch of F-150s, Explorers, and the heavy duty for our uh, guys to go out and repair the streets and also uh, do main breaks and stuff, the tandem dumps, five yard dumps. And we have the sewer combos, 24. And uh, basically we're trying to, uh, instead of, we don't have electric really to get into those, but looking at CNG, then a bunch of off-road stuff. Next. Okay, we're not quite as far as Charlotte, which seemed to be as looks great with their electric vehicles. Right now, we have uh, we start with CNG. We have nine of the uh, Nissan Leafs, the uh, Chevy Volts, and we have the uh, Ford F one hundred and fifty Lightnings. We have a couple of those on order that we hope to put into use as soon as we get them. Next. Uh, also, as far as sustainability, what we've looked at, we created a car share program. And uh, basically, uh, this is uh, automated through, I don't know if a lot of y'all have heard of Agile Fleet, but we go through them. They handle the uh, software for us and we'll go a little bit more into that. Next slide. We have uh, two locations where we have several vehicles in the uh, fleet that we can share during the day or evening. Uh, total vehicles, 45. Uh, a lot of them, as you see, one of the most heavy used 12.7% of the time is the six electric vehicles. Uh, we put those in. A lot of people said that no one really wanted to drive electric, but we put them in and they're really uh, being used. It was especially right before the pandemic, that's when we started the car share program. It was really trending up. But uh, when that happened, everything went down a little bit. And for January, we had 48 trip, which is starting to come back to where it uh, used to be up in the hundreds. And uh, we have two locations, uh, 14th Street and 72 Marriott, which is our uh, main office. It's right in the middle of downtown. And we have a beam uh, solar panel charger there that we use to charge those vehicles. Uh, we have uh, of the 10 vehicles that you see there, four of them are the uh, electric lease. 
and total users in the system right now at 265. And uh, it's also cut us back a little bit. We're right now, we're on hybrid schedule. So three days in the office and two days at home. So uh, when we get back to full uh, capacity, I think these numbers would go up. Next slide. Okay, also all our vehicles have telematics and we use that, definitely we're gonna use that to uh, look at which areas we can use to electrify those vehicles. Next slide, please. And basically what we use right now is Samsara, which gives us the real GPS tracking. And what we really like about Samsara is that we can put it into electric vehicles and they work with no problem. Our former uh, telematics, we will put it in and get problems with uh, starting the vehicles or getting a whole bunch of fault codes. So Samsara has really been the uh, way to go for us. Next slide. And another thing is it has the driver app, which uh, they can get in on their city phone, which gives us all these reports about where they're going, how their routes are. We can uh, streamline some routes to help with uh, gas savings, that kind of thing. And also get a lot of idling. We can pull idling reports, which as we know is a big deal. Um, when it's cold or hot, mainly hot is the real major problem for us being here in Atlanta where it's, uh, you know, during the summer, spring and summer times, when it's in the 80s and 90s, guys like to sit in their cars or trucks with the AC going. So we're trying to cut that out as much as possible to save on our gas and uh, that kind of thing. Next slide. Okay, now for the whole city of Atlanta, there is uh, our goals for electrification and sustainability. And I'd like to uh, talk a little bit more about that. Next slide. Basically, our total fleet inventory as a whole is 3,731 vehicles. That's uh, airport, uh, our public works, uh, police, and fire. So as you see, we have a different proportion. Uh, hybrids and uh, hybrid plugins, we've uh, used pretty well. Basically, the Leafs, and we have a few Priuses in there at the airport. and. Um, they seem to be going very well. And I think we have one electric bus that they just got and they're working with. And uh, so we're working with those guys more now than we had before. Used to be kind of every department did their own thing. But as the, I'll tell you later, we start to work as a committee to see how we can purchase stuff and get savings together. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, the goals are uh, for the city of Atlanta adopted by the city council is uh, our number two goal, clean energy, 30% by 2025. Uh, as you see in the uh, next slide, we are a little behind that, but we're striving to try to catch up and meet that goal. Next slide. And also uh, we've talked about uh, equity where in certain, uh, neighborhoods that aren't quite as uh, prosperous as others. We're making sure we've been equitable of putting that we do charges and stuff that we put them in those areas also. That is just not, you know, you put them in certain areas and, and the other areas of the city don't have it. So we're making sure that everything is equitable and everybody can enjoy the success and benefits of going electric. Next slide, please. Okay. As our sustainability metrics look at, we've we've done very well as far as commercial buildings and energy production and even green space. But as you see the transportation and mobility, that's where we're having a few problems. Um, some of this is about ordering vehicles, which although getting the vehicles is pretty much the uh, easiest thing to do. But the thing, as everybody knows, is getting the uh, charging. So we've had problems getting charges. Right now, we're trying to get a citywide uh, PF, uh, P2 so that we can, uh, everybody can buy off this one contract and get charging and uh, help everybody else. Next slide. Okay, as I told you, our goal for uh, 2025 is 30%. Right now, we're really at 13.02% as far as for 
2021. 2022 probably is about the same. So we worked with uh, Georgia Power. They've shown us their mix on what they're doing. Right now, they're 8% renewables. And we're trying to work with them to purchase infrastructure. And then they also give us some special rates as far as the city as uh, to use uh, their power. Next slide. Okay, but we have had some successes, as you saw. Um, as of right now, Atlanta ranks third on the EPA's 2022 list of top cities with Energy Star certified buildings. Uh, I'm very happy to tell you that uh, we were the 33rd Green Fleet. This is all the fleet together for the whole city of Atlanta. Uh, we we uh, placed our uh, request to NAFO with our uh, perform our profile in that. And we're happy to get number 33. Uh, as you see, we've got some other few awards, uh, North American EPA's Energy Star Cities, number three, that kind of thing. And we work with other uh, communities and uh, at like Weather Rise, Lake Charlotte, Carbon Credit Program, the Tree Protection Ordinance, Greenback Opportunity. There's just many ways that we can use uh, other uh, places to help us try to meet our goal of clean energy. Uh, next slide. That's okay. Again, we CDP says we got the A for the first time. Very happy about that. And uh, only 12% of the people, other cities received it. So our mayor was very happy. <laughs> next slide. Also, to reach this uh, sustainability goal, we're working with uh, Cherry Street Energy. Next slide, please. Sorry about that. Uh, Cherry Street Energy became Atlanta's renewable energy source in 2017 for solar energy. And in 2019, the Department of Watershed, we signed on with them also. Next slide. So what they do is provide the cost of solar energy, the competitive utility energy costs, and it's projected to be increasingly lower as time passes and utility rates continue to rise. The cost of the solar energy costs, Department of Watershed Management has the opportunity to save on their total electric costs by installing solar capacity. As more capacity is install, installed, more savings are realized. Okay, let's look at some of the savings we hope to get. Uh, the first year, uh, which is last year, we got 188000 That was just by signing up with Georgia Power, getting that special rate, and projected sales when solar capacity is met. Uh, over the whole 20 year period, it will be about $6.7 million. And the first year savings when solar is in, we're uh, installing it is 228K. Next slide. The plan of action, next slide, is to uh, we have these water treatment plants. We have four that we're looking to add solar to on the roofs or even uh, like a solar. Uh, in areas where we don't have any buildings and stuff, just have a solar uh, field of panels. And we have four of those Chattahoochee, South River, Utah Creek, and Hemp Hill. As you see, like the one Utah Creek, that's 1,064 kilowatts. But we were savings uh, increase in what we already have, 8.1%, like and that will lead to $98,976 savings for that year. As you see, over the 20 year again, $6.7 million by adding that solar. Next slide. Again, first year, 188,000, projected 20 year, 5.4, and then with solar, 6.7 million. Next slide. Here's what it looks like. This is the first one we've done at our Utah Creek facility. As you see, we use the roofs, and also uh, a few on the ground. But what we're doing is connecting that too. I didn't have a picture of the charges, but we've added uh, five charges to that site also. Charge point. We use charge point charges through uh, the Georgia Power. Next slide. Okay, our strategies for electrification and sustainability. We go with clean energy, energy funding. We got to identify partnerships and define funding. 
community and partner engagement, uh, about communicating what we're doing to our uh, community so that they'll get on board and help us to uh, reduce our uh, use of energy. We're trying to decarbonize Atlanta, reduce building greenhouse gas emissions, and implement building performance standards, which we've done very well, as you see by around A rating. And where we haven't done quite so well is transportation infrastructure. We need to get together as all departments to define a roadmap and timeline for EV infrastructure, citywide charging stations to complete cities and transit oriented development. Next slide. And to that purpose, just uh, this month, we set up our new interdepartmental EV fleet and infrastructure committee. This committee will meet monthly. It's involved right now in the Department of Watershed, Public Works, and Atlanta Airport. What we do, we're going to meet to discuss and cooperate for collective purchasing opportunities and also grants and federal funding. Because right now, at that meeting, I learned that the airport is applying for a grant for 25 actual vehicles. So uh, in the future, hopefully, we can get in one of those opportunities to purchase vehicles or at least uh, apply for the same kind of grant so that we can get some vehicles for us also. Electric vehicle charging stations, secure citywide contract. We think this is, we everybody, we have a contract, we're in place. Right now, the only way we've been able to do uh, charging stations is to secure three quotes, that kind of thing. And uh, it just takes a long while. And uh, this would really help us if we could get that uh, established. New electric vehicle purchase. We need to set goals with each department so that everybody can reach the 20% goal by uh, the year 2035. And then electric vehicle charging gaps is where we need to locate and close any charging spots where the, our fleet needs to go and uh, to help us reach our goal at 20%. And uh, that's my last slide, I think. Uh, hopefully it was helped anybody who has some questions and uh, I'm available. Talk to you later. Okay, great. Thank you, Robert. No, you know, the point out of, you know, cross-functional teams and stakeholder involvement, that's how you get this done. And then you're know, reiterating what Chris said, you know, Charging is the key. Just same thing with any alt field. Your main question is, you know, do I have access to fuel? How do I get it? And without it, you know, whatever it goes on, they're not going to be running. So we're going to go ahead and open up. This looks like we had a good good number of questions out there. We'll see what we can get through in the next handful, you know, 15 or 20 minutes or so. All right. All right, somebody's asking about the drive tool. We're going to provide that link. In fact, we'll probably in the email we send out for the with the presentations and the recording link. We should probably have Sarah give us the link, so we'll do that. Oh, Sarah gave it anyway. Hmm. Okay. In terms of training, I know Wake Tech is rolling one out for both charger and vehicle maintenance. Chris, what are, what are you guys doing for maintenance? Um, yeah, so here, here in Charlotte, we have Central Piedmont Community College, the largest community college in North Carolina, and they have a really um, good automotive program, mm -hmm. and they were one of the first Tesla um, trained garages in the nation. Right. Uh, we've partnered with them and they're working to develop curriculum for our technicians. And so we've sent a number of our mechanics through their training so far. And uh, we do, uh, one of the questions was, do we service our vehicles ourselves? And we do, for the most part, we do occasionally outsource when we need to, but for the most part, we maintain all our own equipment in-house. Yeah, and I, I dropped um, a response to this in the Q&A as well. Um, I would say most of the fleets that we have worked with are not 
currently widely training their maintenance techs on EV maintenance, just because, as Chris can probably attest to, there isn't much that you need to do right now, unless you're planning on keeping the vehicles beyond their eight to 10 year battery warranty. You really wouldn't touch those high voltage systems anyways. But um, fleets that we have talked to, like Charlotte, they have been working with either local community colleges or regional OEMs that provide vehicle specific training. Um, and we we did have a webinar on this kind of tech training uh, topic about a year ago. So I posted the link to that as well as there is a, a new group kind of creating a, a national EV tech certification process called EV Pro Plus, and they do in-person hands-on trainings around the country. So I, I dropped the link in there as well. Yeah, I will add the uh, training does require um, their special safety um, tools and uh, our, the tooling, the PPE, it, uh, it's definitely different and does require training. And uh, we also, with when we're purchasing EVs, we reach out to local dealers, like we have some Kia uh, Nero EVs, and we made sure to check with our local dealers to make sure they could help us with servicing those um, before we made that purchase. So that's another good thing to do. Right. I guess, you know, somebody's asking about your F-150s. How long have you had those, Chris, and I guess how many miles? Yeah, we got, we we were fortunate to receive two F-150 Lightnings in August. Um, so we put those in the service shortly after. Um, we have one in a motor pool that where the uh, truck can be checked out. Uh, it only has a little over 2,000 miles on it so far, so it has not needed any service. We have one in our street maintenance uh, division that's over uh, or just about 6,000 miles. We have its uh, first, uh, we, we schedule light duty preventive maintenance internally at 6,000 mile in intervals, although EVs, like Sarah said, don't require very much, but we're meeting in the next few weeks to um, discuss what maintenance that will need. Uh, it includes tire rotation, checking coolants, looking at the brakes, tire wear, things like that, but it uh, is far less and most of the EVs um, only require like a every seven to 10,000 miles uh, a real basic check. And then two years, you kind of check the coolant and change the cabin air filter kind of thing. But the maintenance is a lot less than a fossil fuel vehicle. All right, I'm scrolling down some uh... There was a question about, do we include um, the total cost of ownership calculation? Do we include charging? Sure, and yeah. The answer to that is we don't. We also have in-ground diesel and gasoline storage, above ground too, for that matter. But we don't include any of our fueling infrastructure citywide in our TCO uh, calculations, whether it be gas, diesel, or um, electric. Right. I guess, Robert, you know, you talked about your telematic systems. Somebody asked, do you have a problem with removing the telematics devices? Uh, are they talking about moving it from vehicle to vehicle? Uh, that one, I, I'm not sure. Oh. Well, if that's the case, no, they're pretty uh, plugged into the OBD. And, oh, okay, that's the plug. They're not hardwired in somewhere. Because some no. of the ones, they're hardwired them in. And I guess a warning on that, we had... Oh, and after a few years back, somebody's complaining that their vehicles, the, even their, their their EVs, their 12 volt systems were dead when they came in after the weekend. Yeah. And I said, you got a parasitic loss somewhere. What's going on? And <laughs> you know, like, you, you had telematics on it? Like, yeah. Well, you telematics. I go, how are they put in? And they're hardwired under the dash. I said, right. they're on a live power system. They gotta, you got to shut them off when they come in the yard. And that yeah. was that was the issue with that one. Was, yeah. And, and yeah strong, um, if, um, my old uh, telematics company, ours would kill the battery. And so that's why we switched because you could just plug them in and uh, they work well. Right. In, in Charlotte, we do use a dongle and we put them behind the dash where they're harder for employees oh. to tamper with. Um, um, but we haven't had any issues with them killing batteries or causing problems. They're, they're very useful and we, we use them for lots of data. Wow. All right. I'm going to switch over to the Q&A. We, we, 
we had two two ways to communicate, and some folks did the chat, some did Q and A. Let's see what we get out there. Have you been able to look at this? I the, the difference between summer and winter with you know what range is stated and what you lose, and I can comment on that. I've I got Rich Krieger has been tracking that up in Iowa um, pretty strongly, and he. It's more than I thought in some cases, but and Sarah may have some comments. Go ahead, Chris. Uh, Sarah, feel free if you have any comments. I'm so sorry. I was typing an answer to another uh, question. And I missed right. one. Just, what uh, was the question? Range degradation, uh, hot and cold. And, and you know, my, I used to tell people 25 to 30, and I'm hearing up to 50% in some cases. For um for cold weather. Cold weather range degradation, yes. I think um we typically say around twenty percent. Um, yeah. I I think it it really depends on you know it's a combination of cold weather and how you're using the vehicle. It can be higher if you have folks that are blasting the heat and using all of the accessories. And so um, it, it really varies by person. But we do have some fleets operating in cold weather that um they have said it it doesn't really impact their operations and i actually think we have a case study from um i believe uh des moines iowa where it gets very cold right. um so i will drop the link to that in the chat yeah no that's the number i tell folks is 25 to 30 typically. yeah in in charlotte we haven't seen much from hot or cold um maybe less than 10 percent, i would say but we Often don't leave the city limits. We have domicile charging, so it's not much of an issue. And if you do have an EV charger, you can precondition your cabin um, to heat or cool before you leave. So that is nice. I have noticed, like, uh, I've taken the F-150 Lightning to Asheville to a conference and uh, going interstate speed up a mountain. I lost about 7% of range versus what it said it could do. Um, and that's without being, uh, you know, towing or hauling. Um, we have trailered some stuff around town, again, at, you know, in the city at low speed, and uh, the, the impacts weren't very big. But uh, on the interstate, it makes a difference. I had a big headwind coming back from Raleigh the last time I had the F-150 Lightning in Raleigh, and I lost, um, like, I, I should have had a 40-mile buffer of charge and I got back with like a 10 mile buffer. So it, it does, you know, weather, wind, load um, can have an impact. No, that, that helps obvious. Although Chris coming down the mountain, you see the yeah, other no, regenerative yeah, braking it, helps you quite a bit. Your range, your range should go up as you come down that hill. Yeah, <laughs> no, the regenerative braking, yeah, coming back was not a problem at all. Getting there was not a problem. Like the truck has enough range for the, it's only 185 miles or something from Charlotte to Asheville. So, both directions, it wasn't a problem, but uh, I did notice it was about 7% less going up the mountain that sometimes 70 mile an hour, you know, and the F 150 is a bit of a brick in the wind. So right. uh, I, it, I, I've been getting about 1.6 miles per kilowatt versus like a Kia Nero EV, or we have one Mustang Mach E that you can get 3.5 to 4 miles per kilowatt. So Smaller, lighter, more aerodynamic EVs are more efficient. Oh, yeah. And no, Chevy okay. Bolt. We have a bunch of Chevy Bolts that are super efficient, but they charge at 50, the fastest they'll charge is 50 kilowatts. So they're a lousy out of town car. It takes a long time to charge if you have to recharge out of town. Right. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, the same with no matter what type of vehicle you're driving, the way you drive it affects your, your fuel economy. And if you're real hard on them, and then you get a, with the electric fuels even more so, Pay attention. Don't be hard on the brakes. Let that regenerative braking help you out a little bit um, to get range. But you know, hard acceleration, hard stop, speeding, uh, crosswinds. You know, your fuel economy is going to go down. I see one question you about private EV um, charging and right. I do do travel out of town. I use Electrify America EV Go and. Right. those folks and you know you just swipe a credit card and occasionally there's an issue but most often yeah. it uh, it works okay yeah there, there have been some fleets and bus fleets across the country that have, have done charging as a service where company comes in capex is theirs maintenance is theirs everything 
and they they pay a service fee to cover it. Um, that is an option for some folks, and I think you know we'll we'll see more of that as more and more charging needs uh, come as more vehicles come. In terms of hydrogen, we're the last couple of years we've been hearing a lot more on hydrogen. Uh, certain areas are a little further ahead. The, the issue is, you know, just like with any alt fuel, is the infrastructure. Uh, hydrogen is 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 behind everybody else at this point. And you know, medium and heavy duty and long haul, there's there's a lot of discussion of hydrogen being the solution. We're seeing um, AC transit out in the West Coast. Some of the longer routes, the electric buses wouldn't. Um, wouldn't be able to do it. They'd have to they, they'd have to get a charge somewhere. And they went to the, the hydrogen buses on those routes. They've been performing like champs. They absolutely love them. They they think they're great. So it it's there. Um, you know, when you go to the conferences, you you hear they call it the 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 flavor that's going on. You know, a handful of years back, everybody was saying it was the CNG conference when you went to a fleet conference. And it was the telematics conference. Then it's become the electrification. And all these conferences for the last probably two year and a half to two years, we're hearing a lot more about hydrogen. So it's, you know, I, I, we're, we're still in who's, I don't know if anybody's gonna actually win. We're looking for the best fit in each application and, you know, hydrogen may have its place at the table. Yeah, I'd say there's not one size fits all. Here in Charlotte, we have a lot of CNG sanitation trucks. Some of our Charlotte water um, larger vehicles are CNG. We have a, a lot of light duty electric. We have a lot of, uh, you know, F-150 hybrid uh, hybrid uh, SUVs and things like that. For instance, um, we have some propane um, biofuel vehicles. Um, we, we continue to look at other options. I'm intrigued by like, I think it's pronounced Helion. I think out of Texas that uses electric drivetrain and like RNG um, power generation on board for a kind of a hyper hybrid um, electric vehicle. So there's. Yeah. Again, there's another you know, question regarding leasing equipment and that's, you know, we're gonna have a lot of creativity here to meet the charging needs. Uh, public private partnerships yes. as a service, some, uh, you know, funding and, and, and capital financing creativity, so. Especially school bus fleets that really seems to be taking off in different parts of the country. And yeah. if someone can come in and offer you charging and electric vehicles and things that kind of what your total budget is for replacements and fuel and maintenance mm -hmm. for, for a turnkey um, operation, you know, it's worth looking at the numbers for sure. Right, right. And then, you know, we've seen this in the past. I don't know if, if Charleston, you do have public charges, but some of the charges that your your fleet uses you know, during the day when they're at work, having the, the sites open for public charging. Are you guys doing that? I've, I've heard of, you know, a number of places. We did it um, with a project we did with 10 municipalities. We put them in their parking garages mm -hmm. and city vehicles charged overnight, but during the day, they allowed the public to charge at them. Yeah, our government center deck and fire department headquarters, a few places like that. I think we have 60 plugs that are open to the public. Some people that live in apartments and things nearby use those. And uh, then we've had to start putting up signage to uh, limit their use for after hours when our fleet comes back and needs to charge overnight. So that is something that you have to manage, but uh, it can be a, a shared scenario for, for sure. Mm -hmm. And this is the last one, which we're just a touch over here. And Minneapolis is saying they're seeing 60% range in their coldest weather. So, wow. There's, 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 it gets cold up there. We used to do with GM, we had cold weather uh, testing site in, yeah, up in, up in uh, Minnesota. Huh. So. Yeah, I, I'll just touch on that really quick. I forgot to mention, <laughs> I think one of the things that folks don't realize too is cold weather can also affect charging speeds. Um, I took out a, a Rivian R1T when I was back in Ohio over the holidays during the polar vortex. And it took a lot longer to DC fast charge than it would have normally because the battery had to get warmed up. So that's also a consideration you'll want to think about if you have high turnover vehicles that need to charge in cold weather as well. Had, had the vehicle sat, because if you've been running it, you, the, theoretically the battery should have been warm 
because it was discharging. But it, because that's what we recommend is, you know, plug your vehicles right away when you come home in the cold weather so the battery's warm because below a certain temperature, it really won't charge. Mm -hmm. It, I think uh, it had sat and it had been driven. Um, it was, you know, I charged it a couple of different times and it, it right. still had an impact even after being driven. But driven. Um, in general, best vehicle I have ever driven in the snow. Yeah. Well, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up here. Any any final remarks from our from our panelists? Um, I, I really appreciate you guys taking your time. Well, Thanks for having everybody taking their time today. Some really good information, and we'll we'll get the recording and the the uh, links and the presentations out to everybody in the next couple of days. All right, I'm going to go ahead and well, I think Annette, we're going to close it out for today. Thank you. Thanks, Good day, all. All right. Sarah, Robert, and Chris, thank you all. And thank you all for hanging in with us. Please do not forget to join us on March 23rd for the next SFT webinar. Everybody have a great afternoon. All right. All right. Thank you.